Hey, happy Wednesday, uh, juniors. Uh, good morning or afternoon, whatever the case may be. Um, it is Monday night in Milwaukee. So I'm making Wednesday's video on Monday night because I'm not sure I will be able to do that driving home on Wednesday in the car or, or Tuesday, tomorrow. Nay, tomorrow Nathan has an infusion at the hospital. He's fine. Uh, anyway, so I don't know what day it is, but you're watching this on Wednesday, so it must be Wednesday for you, which is nice. So, uh, Wife of Bath's Tale, we're going to, um, uh, being Wednesday, I'm sure you're probably about done with Partner's Tale business and ready to work on uh, Wife of Bath's Tale uh, today. Um, listening in class, uh, there's this video that's probably will carry over into Thursday, tomorrow, and then I hope to see you on Friday. So before we look at the literature, before we do anything else, before you get out textbooks, I want to do this little poll. You can see it on the screen here. Um, so here's what you're going to do, and you, you may need to pause the video, um, Ms. Butcher or Mr. Cannell, um, whichever hour this is, um, and uh, help, the, help the students do this. But uh, this is kind of one of my favorite things to do uh, every year. And here's, here's the question, okay? Um, ladies, you're going to answer first and pause the video and take some time to share out loud, loud and proud. Um, the question is, what do women want most in life? Okay, ladies, I want you to answer that question. What do you ladies want most in life? Okay, and once you pause the video and discuss that, I want you to do the second question. Uh, question B, what do you think guys would say that you want most in life? All right, so pause the video, do those first uh, for the ladies, A and B, and then we'll come back. Okay, go ahead and pause for a cause right now. Okay, I didn't really pause. I was just frozen in time. It was pretty fun. Uh, gentlemen, now it's your turn. Similar questions uh, with a little twist from your angle. What do you think, guys, that women want most in life? What would you say that they want most in life? And then, of course, letter B, what do you think women would say? Now, you've heard what the ladies say. So disagree or agree or come up with something new, all right? Um, think about other, um, other ladies that you know other than the ones in the room with you. Um, what do you think uh, a woman would say that she wants most in life? Okay, and so just a, just a little bit of a kind of a lead in to uh, The Wife of Bath's Tale. It's really, really pretty cool. Um, I'm going to switch over in just a second and cover some highlights for you uh, of The Wife of Bath's Tale. And there are discussion questions on the next page. I'm going to share this document with you uh, tonight, so you should have it by tomorrow, so you can kind of be looking ahead. Uh, but they're here, okay? And you'll notice up here, if you can see what I'm doing on the screen here, uh, this whole document, just for simplicity's sake, um, these are questions for juniors for the Canterbury Tales and seniors for the Iliad all in one document, okay? So uh, juniors ignore the senior questions, seniors ignore junior questions, okay? Very good. Um, so one of the things right up front to look at in uh, The Wife of Bass Tale is the literary focus. You know, what is that, what is that um, literary skill that I want you to, to think about and get better at looking for? So if you recall, the liter literary focus of The Partner's Tale was all about irony. So many different examples of irony in The Partner's Tale. Uh, irony in the tale he told, irony in the fact that the partner was a very corrupt member of the church, uh, member of the clergy, um, ironic that people would pay him good money for pardoning their sins from a guy who sins freely and admits it and is almost proud of it. Uh, however, today, uh, The Wife of Bath's Tale, the emphasis is really on uh, the narrator. And so here we have, first of all, a female narrator. And you may, you may want to take a few minutes and, and pause and go back and, and kind of review uh, the Wife of Bath description from the prologue. Remember, she's one of the pilgrims on the uh, pilgrimage from London, tabered in to Canterbury Cathedral, to the shrine of Thomas Becket. And there is a description of her, what, what she looks like, what she does, a little bit about her history. And so as you read and listen to on the CD, listen to her story that she tells about a knight, um, kind of think about these questions here in italics. How does, how does what I know about the wife of Bath influenced my understanding and appreciation of the story she tells. Um, 
Or in other words, the next question, what, what, what connections can I make between the tail and the teller? And we don't know much about her, but we know some things. And it's interesting when you listen to the story she tells, which is all about men and women, and you consider the fact that she as a narrator is a woman, how does that influence your understanding and how does that influence how, how that tale comes off from her as opposed to somebody else in the group telling the story? Um, so a little hint down here, remember uh, the things that we've learned in the prologue about her. She's been married five times. That's just one little thing to keep in mind. This is the lady who has been through five husbands. Okay, keep that in mind. Um, her story is about a knight. Okay, not the knight who is traveling along the road. This is just another kind of a fairy tale knight. So no connection there. Don't be confused with that. Um, so for number two, be looking for this. What is the knight's crime? What is his punishment? His original punishment in the story. And do you believe that punishment fits the crime? Uh, number three, who offers the knight a different option for punishment and what might be significant about that person? Uh, four, do you agree with the answer to the knight's riddle that he's going to get in the story? And if Chaucer thought the answer was true, do you still think it's true today? Why or why not? It would be a great class discussion point. If you don't get to it until I get back, we'll, maybe we'll talk about it on Friday. Um, five, six, and seven on this page, what is the... Uh, woman's argument in, in the story for why the knight should accept her as his wife. Um, she gives, excuse me, I got a typo there. Let me fix that. That irritates me. She gives three distinct reasons. Uh, name them and explain them. Uh, six, do you believe her argument is sound or weak and why? And then finally, do you believe the knight deserves what he gets at the end of the story? Why or why not? Those are the things to look ahead for. So you can have this document open uh, as you read. gives you some a little bit of direction and kind of a little bit of a framework for reading the story. This is a really, really good one. I think the partner's tale is cool. This is, this is really good for entirely different reasons. Just a totally different story. Okay, I'm going to pause real quick and switch over to the other screen. Okay, and I'm back. And now you can see the, uh, the text here. Uh, for your own uh, enjoyment and uh, benefit, if you want to uh, take a second and pause, this is page uh, 179 in the textbook. Uh, or if you scanned all your pages, find this page 179 in the lower left corner. I'll give you a chance to do that. Uh, pause for a cause if you need to. And we're back. Uh, I'm going to read just this first part. You're going to listen to part of this on the CD, but it's just easier for me to, to read it myself and get my thoughts in order here so I don't forget what I want to say. Um, but I'm just going to read this first little part and do a little bit of explaining. I think this is really kind of cool. Uh, a little bit naughty, but, but still kind of cool. All right, so read along with me, and then we'll, we'll discuss a little bit as we go. When good King Arthur ruled in ancient days, a king that every Briton loves to praise, <laughs> excuse me, this was a land brimful of fairy folk. The elf queen and her courtiers joined and broke their elfin dance on many a green mead, or so was the opinion once, I read, hundreds of years ago in days of yore. But no one now sees fairies any more. For now the saintly charity and prayer of holy fires seem to have purged the air. They search the countryside through field and stream, as thick as motes that speckle a sunbeam, blessing the halls, the chambers, kitchens, bowers, cities and boroughs, castles, courts and towers, thorps, barns and stables, outhouses and dairies, and that's the reason why there are no fairies. Wherever there was wont to walk an elf, today there walks the holy friar himself, as evening falls or when the daylight springs, saying his matins and his holy things, walking his limit round from town to town, Women can now go safely up and down, by every bush or under every tree. There is no other incubus but he. Take a little second and look at that side note. Incubus is an evil spirit believed to descend on a sleeping woman and make her pregnant. Preggers! Very interesting. So we are talking about a friar, a member of the church. Remember that in the Pardoner's Tale, you had a story told by a member of the church about how it was so important to not be greedy because the, the love of money is the root of all evil. But of course that was ironic because our partner is very, very crooked um, and very, very greedy. And he's going to go to hell for it and he knows it and he doesn't care. Um, but nevertheless, the truth of what he's saying is that, um, you know, you should live your own life righteously so you don't go to hell like he does. So that was, that was the other day with the, with the irony thing. Now we have not a pardoner but a friar. 
again, another member of the church. And as you read through all the Canterbury Tales, time and time again, Chaucer seems to, seems to pick on people from the church. And you have to kind of wonder, um, here's, here's Chaucer writing about a group of people who are headed to a church to pay homage to a, a very respectable man, Thomas a. Beckett, who was struck down, assassinated, as you read, uh, and murdered uh, in Canterbury Cathedral for supporting the Pope, so for supporting his faith. And yet, in the Canterbury Tales, Chaucer seems to point out a lot of church uh, officials who are as crooked and rotten as they can be. Uh, kind of an interesting to keep in mind. So this friar in this case, if you go through here, um, basically says that the land that this tale unfolds in used to be populated with lots of little fairies and things, and some of which were good little spirits, and some were kind of um, mischievous little spirits. <coughs> Excuse me. But because the friars went around and sang all their holy little prayers and blessing this and that and whatever, um, the, the fairies are all gone, which, which is good, right? Because women can go through the woods alone and not be bothered by the little fairies or, every, or elves or any other mischievous little spirits. But then all of a sudden Chaucer hits us, hits us with this incubus part in line 54 where he says that uh, the, la the ladies are safe walking up and down, but there is no other incubus but he, meaning that friar. So there is really no, else, no one else to hurt you, and he will do no, no more than take your virtue. Uh, so yeah, the fairies are gone, and so now the only evil thing in the forest is the friar himself. So ladies... Take your chances. Go for a walk in the woods. There aren't any fairies anymore, but you might get preggers, made preggers by a friar. Okay, That's in, an interesting little thing to note. That's as weird as that sounds, and as naughty as that is, that is exactly what he's saying. Um, and then he goes on into the story of this knight from King Arthur's Day, and so on and so forth, who was a lusty liver. Okay, now... Take a look at this. We don't mean a man who lives. Uh, in medieval times, the liver, not the heart, was believed to be the source of all desires and emotions. Okay? Um, so uh, I'm going to stop there because the rest of this is on the recording. Uh, and I know that first part was too. But I just kind of wanted to clarify that. So again, keep in mind, we're already setting up this idea uh, of, of gender, okay, of males versus females in here. You took your little poll, you did your little class activity, and keep in mind too, in terms of narrator, we have gender-wise a, a female telling the story about a male, about a knight. Yes, there is another woman in there too, uh, as well. In fact, there's a knight, uh, there's a king, there's a queen, and there is a, uh, a woman, uh, well actually two women, a young woman and an older woman. Uh, so really about uh, five major characters. This is uh, likely going to become an essay pretty soon, um, either on the test or on the midterm. Okay, we'll, we'll see it uh, soon enough, okay? And I think that might be it for now, unless I think of something else that I forgot, which probably is true, because it's really late. Okay, I did think of something else. Um, Sorry about that. Before I let you go and, and listen to the, the story in its entirety, there are a couple of tricky passages in here, and I don't want you to get sidetracked or confused as you listen to them. Um, the wife of Bath, as she's telling this story, she kind of digresses from her story and just starts running off at the mouth uh, kind of on her own um, thoughts about what, what women want. And so uh, page 180, if you uh, have a second, you can just take a, take a look at there really quick. Um, right here I have, this is my, a scan of my book here, uh, This where this letter D, it's, it's like around between lines 105 and 110. Um, as she's telling the story about what various women in, this, in her story about this night say about what women want most, she digresses herself here where she says, this line right here, this is the wife of Bath, it's kind of speaking for herself. So we're out of her story. Okay, remember the whole concept of the Canterbury Tales? It's a frame story, a story within another story. So now we're kind of stepping out of the, the actual story about the night that she's telling as they're going down the road to Canterbury. And now we're listening to her talk to the other pilgrims around her um, with her own thoughts where she's saying that this one answer about how she thinks maybe women want to be, um, you know, fussed over and, uh, you know, uh, held, you know, and 
high regard and, you know, pampered and paid attention to and, you know, flattered and all those kinds of things. So where she says here, that's very the, near the truth, it seems to me, a man can win us best with flattery. This is where she is now putting her story about the night on pause for a minute and is just speaking freely on kind of of her own thoughts. And in that process of sharing her thoughts, she starts to talk about various women, and you kind of wonder if maybe she's talking about herself a little bit here too, where she says, um, you know, women want their feelings respected, uh, they don't want to be made fun of, and we like to be thought of as, now I'm at the top of, that would be 181, I guess, we like to be thought of a wise, thought wise and void of sin, uh, others assert we find it sweet when we're thought dependable or discreet and secret, um, never betraying things that we are told. Now, at the, at the risk of, of being um, gender biased here, uh, I would say that many people might be quick to say, oh yeah, uh, girls are more into gossip than guys. Okay, I'll just go out on a limb and say that I think a lot of people would, would say that. Um, I think probably at the high school age and certainly in the college age, I think that's true of many people, regardless of gender. So, um, in fact, uh, Confucius, ancient Chinese philosopher, um, said, you know, basically that, that, you know, only one person can really keep a secret. You, you tell one person, uh, they're going to tell somebody else, okay, most of the time. Not all the time, most of the time. So um, the last thing I want to just kind of draw your attention and kind of explain and paraphrase before you listen to it is this other story that she goes off on a tangent with about King Midas. You might have heard of Midas, the king who, you know, everything he touched turned to gold. Um, but uh, there was another story about him um, from the, uh, the Roman, po Roman poet Ovid. Uh, when you get to be seniors, we'll read some of the Metamorphoses, which is his major work, kind of about the creations of the, the world and the universe and so on and so forth. Um, but uh, the, the paraphrase is, it starts, I'm going to paraphrase right here, um, starts around 1.30. Um, according to one of Ovid's stories about King Midas, King Midas grew a pair of donkey ears, okay, and it says ass's ears, and it's great fun to say the word ass in school in this context, because it's kind of like swearing, but it's not really. And... Um, the idea was here is that King Midas had all of a sudden this pair of donkey's ears, and his wife, um, of course, very embarrassed by this, and uh, this was her secret. She didn't want anybody to know that her husband had a pair of donkey ears. Absolutely ridiculous, uh, because it looked terrible, and um, she did not want people making fun of her husband, and therefore that reflected badly on her. She didn't want to be made fun of for having a husband with donkey ears. Think of all the names people could have called him. And so she had this secret bottle up inside of her, and but she had to tell somebody. Now remember, this is the wife of Bath taking a break from her story about the night and telling this other story about Midas's wife. And so what she does is that she was so afraid that she was going to blab it to somebody uh, who would either make fun of her husband or her that she runs down um, to the Reedy Marsh, okay, so a little lake area, a shoreline of a lake or something like that, um, where she reaches the sedge, which is a kind of a grass-like plant, and she is so desperate to tell somebody that she actually tells the water near the ground, and that's this line here, 150, where she's saying to the water, betray me not a water with thy sound, to thee alone I tell it, it appears my husband has a pair of ass's ears. Ah, my heart's well again, the secret's out, I could no longer keep it, not a doubt. Uh, and so you see, although we may hold fast a little while, it must come out at last. We can't keep secrets, as for Midas, well, read Ovid for his story, he will tell. The, the rest of that story. Um, and if you look at this little um, side note here, uh, 158, in Ovid's version it is Midas' barber, not his wife, who tells the secret to a hole in the ground, and reeds grow up from the spot and whisper the secret whenever the wind rustles through them. So one of those old kind of little stories or myths about why things occur in the natural world as they do, and so why when the wind rushes through uh, different kinds of plants and it has that sort of shimmering, whispering sound, centuries ago somebody said, oh yeah, you know why they make that sound, don't you? They're whispering. They're whispering the secret that Midas's wife whispered to the ground many, many long, you know, long centuries ago and said it and so on and so forth. Um, 
Incidentally, this idea of having donkey ears uh, or a donkey head, that is also picked up a little bit in A Midsummer Night's Dream, one of Shakespeare's uh, comedies, kind of a comedy of errors. Uh, so it's kind of cool when you study literature like this, um, Chaucer being much older than Shakespeare in history, uh, you can kind of see where Shakespeare got some of his ideas and where he pulled little bits from. Uh, we saw that again with Beowulf. Uh, so knowing the background story of Cain and Abel helps you understand where Grendel comes from in Beowulf because it's referred to it a lot and so on and so forth. Okay, that is it. Uh, listen to the CD and uh, I'm done for now. For reals.